in this um, tour de force in looking at this last phase of uh, Catholic history and Catholic development, Roman Catholic history and development, and in order to introduce this very important uh, event in present-day Catholic history, that is uh, Vatican II, it is important to appreciate the background because the contrast between what happened before Vatican II and what happened with Vatican II and afterwards is a serious um, uh, matter. And of course, Vatican II comes after Vatican I and was intended to be the um, completion of Vatican I, which was in itself a very awkward council terminated by a military invasion to Rome by the Italian army and so abruptly interrupted and uh, uh, in need to be properly concluded. And Vatican II uh, follows Vatican I in the sense that wants to be the proper conclusion of Vatican I, but not in terms of a formal bureaucratic conclusion, in terms of a significant change of posture of the Catholic Church with regards to the modern world. Vatican I is the climax of a, a growing fight between the modern world and the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church finding itself sieged uh, around different strands of attack coming from modern society, modern science, modern religions, modern ideologies, modern trends, and wanting to protect the church and wanting to fight back in order to be protected and in order to, to relaunch uh, the claims of the church. We could go on and on in analyzing these trends, but uh, trends coming from science undermining the traditional religious understanding of the origins of the world, uh, trends coming from society uh, pushing towards the uh, implementation and the appreciation of human rights, democracy, uh, trends coming from uh, different religious movements claiming uh, to be um, possible and true ways to God over against the claims of the Catholic Church that outside of its realm there is no salvation. Uh, strands coming from ideologies uh, presenting different uh, worldviews and um, patterns of life and ideologies and uh, threatening uh, the Catholic Church. And Vatican I is a very uh, it is a reflection of these conflicts going around the Catholic Church and threatening its stability, threatening its self-understanding and its uh, future. And with that in mind, <clears throat> the, what happened in Vatican II, of course, not in an abrupt way, we don't hear, have here the time to go through all the <coughs> intervening uh, developments, but Vatican II shows the the desire of the Catholic Church to change its attitude towards the modern world. Instead of fighting over against them, finding common room, common grounds with them. Instead of rejecting them, absorbing them. Instead of uh, having a, uh, going at war, raging war against ideologies, religion, science and society, finding, accommodating their concerns within the sphere, the, uh, the synthesis of the church. So that's the overall uh, paradigm of Vatican II, uh, shifting the attitude of the church and uh, locating it in, um, in the modern world with a diff very different approach, with a different posture. Um, again, the yes and no element. When it comes to the, the main documents of Vatican II, and of course, the, these are very complex and important documents, this will always be, will only be a few comments, but 
Dei Verbum, the Catholic doctrine of Scripture, Revelation. Revelation comes to us through the Scripture. There is one reservoir of revelation coming us through us through Scripture and tradition that belong together and ultimately are known in the voice of the magisterium. So that the end result is that uh, we have the scriptures somewhere in what the Catholic Church teaches, but it is always to be uh, encountered in the context of something that precedes it and something that follows it. And the ultimate result is that it's not going to be the teaching of Scripture alone. It's always the case that the final outcome will be a blurred, distorted, confused, yes and no paradigm. The same is true, same pattern can be seen in the other paradigmatic constitution of the Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, Christ and the Church. Christ is presented, presented as being the light of the nations, but Christ is always organically uh, related and intertwined with the institutional, hierarchical Roman Catholic Church. And so the face of Christ that we, are, <coughs> we can see now has the features of the Church. So there's no Christ alone there but there's always an ecclesiastical Christ. Relationship between the cross and the Eucharist. The cross has a central place in the document on liturgy. But then, again, because of the peculiar understand, Catholic understanding of the Eucharist representing, reenacting the sacrifice of the cross, the cross always has a Eucharistic dimension that uh, diminishes the once and for all achievement of the cross and emphasizes the ever the, the, rep, the, the representations um, of that sacrifice occurring in the Eucharist. And with those representations, the mediation of the church is always implied. Again, there's yes and no elements that are part of the uh, basic shape in which uh, even Vatican II understands basic elements of the Gospel as far as revelation, as far as uh, the relationship between cross, uh, Christ and the Church, and as far as the um, relationship between the cross and the Eucharist uh, is concerned. It's this willingness to integrate, to make synthesis of, to combine, even at the expense of gospel integrity and uh, gospel clarity. And that is, is a thoroughgoing attempt at, uh, that we can witness uh, happening at Vatican II as well.